Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 846 for November 22nd, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. Iowa's the corn state. We produce more corn uh, than any state in the country. And I think there's only one country in the world that produces more corn than the state of Iowa. So, I mean, we produce just insane amounts of corn here. And bourbon is made from corn, so why is anyone making Iowa bourbon? Every craft distiller dreams of not only having their whiskey selling alongside the major global whiskey brands, but outselling those brands in their home market. For Murphy Quint and his family, that dream became reality earlier this month. The Quints run Cedar Ridge Winery and Distillery in Swisher, Iowa. Iowa is a control state, and a couple of weeks ago, the state's liquor agency shocked everyone with the news that over the previous 12 months, Cedar Ridge, Iowa straight bourbon was the state's number one selling bourbon. Not the number one selling Iowa bourbon, but the number one selling bourbon in Iowa, period. The Quint family also has a global whiskey brand too. They're partnering with the heavy metal band Slipknot on the whiskeys that carry the Slipknot name. I'll talk with Murphy Quint later on Whiskey Cast in depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and... Could you do something with rice? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, we could do a, a whiskey with rice, but I'd rather make it a bourbon. The news is next on this episode of Whiskey Cast. Hey, whiskey fans, I'm Gabriel Cartarella, brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch whiskey, Jewers. You could probably guess I've got a lot of stories, but for me, the good ones have one thing in common. They're best told over a glass of whiskey. So hit pause, grab your bottle of Dewar's, and let's get back to this episode of Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. You know, people always ask me, does Redbreast go better with ice or without? Would it go well with figs, dark chocolate, apple crumble? Is there one particular thing I should enjoy it with? I tell them, yeah, other people. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's Thanksgiving week in the U.S., but most whiskey distillers are not feeling very thankful right now. That's because many smaller distillery owners are looking at the calendar as the end of 2020 is getting closer and closer. With that will come the end of the break that craft distillers have received for the last three years on their federal excise taxes, unless Congress and the Trump administration agree to either another temporary extension or to make it permanent. Here's why this issue is so critical. Before the tax break was passed in late 2017, all distillers paid the same excise tax rate of $13.50 per proof gallon of spirits they removed from bonded storage for sale. That 2017 change cut the tax rate to just $2.70 per proof gallon for the first 100,000 proof gallons removed from bond each year. Large whiskey companies blow through that threshold in just a couple of months, but most craft distillers never even get close to it during an entire year, and the savings keep cash flow available for expansion projects along with salaries and benefits. There is widespread support on Capitol Hill for extending the tax break, with 76 senators and more than 350 House members signed on as co-sponsors. But what there is not is a lot of time left to act. December 11th is the current deadline for Congress to pass either appropriations bills or an extension to keep federal agencies from shutting down. And the 18th is the last scheduled day for legislative action before the end of the congressional term. Normally, those dates alone would be enough to put pressure on lawmakers to reach a deal. But, as Margie Lehrman of the American Craft Spirits Association explains, 2020 is still making things even more complicated in its final days. 
the complicating factor is we don't know the appetite right now in the current White House, even if we were to get this extenders through, whether the president would sign it. That's further complicated by not knowing who is in control of the United States Senate. The Georgia Senate race runoff does not take place until the first week in January, which means that in terms of a complicated picture, it's about as complicated as it could be. There is also the question of whether a coronavirus economic stimulus package will make it through Congress in what's called the lame duck session because the tax break legislation could be added into it. And speaking of the coronavirus, the news this week that Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley is quarantining at home after testing positive for the virus creates even more uncertainty. That's because Grassley chairs the Senate Finance Committee, which has to sign off on any of those proposals before they go to the Senate floor. One argument that many distillers have raised in their talks with members of Congress is the fact that the industry, by and large, stepped up to help earlier this year by volunteering to switch their distilleries over to produce hand sanitizer and other disinfectants, during the critical nationwide shortage, with many distillers donating those products to health care providers and first responders. During our live webcast Saturday from Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore, Sagamore Spirit President Brian Tracy told us executives at Johns Hopkins practically begged them to make the switch, and the entire industry stepped up. It's amazing, you know, how many of them rallied to do this. And and so many of them just sold it for a cost or gave it away. And, you know, these distilleries right now are really with the tasting rooms kind of closed or or very limited capacity. I mean, it's it's a really speaks volumes about this community of distillers and what they've done. And, you know, staring down the barrel of of a potential 400 percent tax increase with the FET um, uh, reduction potentially going away at the end of the year. So. Certainly challenging times, but, you know, everyone rolled up their sleeves and said, we got to do this, and it's, it's an amazing community. What's your big fear in the distilling community if this doesn't get approved? Oh, I, I think there's a lot of distilleries that have never actually paid the thirteen fifty a gallon versus the two seventy. And again, you know, this is just parity with beer and wine. We're not asking for any special treatment. Um, the, there's so much uncertainty still with COVID and, and, and the economy and small distilleries. They're not going to be hiring. Um, they're probably going to stop working with local agricultural communities because you do pay a little bit more for local grains. Um, and that it could lead to some closing their doors. Tracy says hiring has been frozen right now at Sagamore Spirit because of the uncertainty over the future of the excise tax break. And without an extension, plans to add several more employees next year will be scrapped along with plans to expand their purchases of grain from local farmers. You can watch the interview and the entire webcast on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel. And full disclosure, Sagamore Spirit is a sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Meanwhile, let's update the status of lockdowns around the world because of the pandemic. Scotland's government has now closed pubs and restaurants in Glasgow and 11 other council areas for at least the next three weeks. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is expected to relax the current 10 p.m. nationwide curfew for pubs and restaurants when England's current lockdown ends on December 2nd, but stricter limits are likely on a regional basis. Leaders of other European countries are also expected to gradually relax their current restrictions in early December, but indications are that pubs and restaurants may be among the last businesses allowed to reopen, depending on the spread of COVID-19 cases. We have also had one more live event canceled because of the pandemic, the Bacon and Bourbon Festival, scheduled for February 13th in Charleston, South Carolina, has now been canceled. Of course, the hospitality industry has been decimated worldwide because of pandemic-related lockdowns. Maker's Mark has now teamed up with 37 of its bar and retailer partners in the U.S. to create a special batch of bourbon. 
The community batch, emphasis on the unity there, well, it's a bit complicated to explain. Those partners all had private selection barrels using a different combination of specially treated barrel staves. The distillery took its cask-strength whiskey and finished it in all of those different barrels for nine weeks separately before blending all of the whiskey and putting it back into those barrels for five more weeks. The community batch will go on sale December 1st at special virtual events around the U.S., with all of the proceeds going to the Lee Initiatives programs to support the hospitality industry. Meanwhile, George Dickel is releasing a new 15-year-old single-barrel Tennessee whiskey. What makes it unusual is that it'll be available by both the barrel and the bottle. Barrels will be available to retailers, bars, and restaurants, while the bottles are available now in six U.S. states, with more coming early next year, at a recommended retail price of $59.99 a bottle. Just down the road in Little Rock, Arkansas, Rocktown Distillery is out with a new bourbon made with Arkansas rice. Founder and distiller Phil Brandon sources all of his grains from Arkansas farmers and came up with the idea a couple of years ago. A friend of mine at the Arkansas Rice Federation came to me and said, hey, you know, we're promoting rice and different things to do with rice. And could you do something with rice? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, we could do a, a whiskey with rice, but I'd rather make it a bourbon and uh, use rice as the middle grain in the mash bill, you know? Um, and so we worked out and I got some uh, rice from them and uh, we made it uh, 54% corn and 36% rice and 10% malted barley and aged it for two years. And then, uh, Bottled it up uh, about a week ago. I know of a couple of other whiskeys that have been done with rice. Uh, so what did the rice do as far as the flavor? You know, it, it kind of uh, has a little bit of a, um, you know, almost a buttery note to it and and uh, um, a bit of sweetness. Um, it's kind of similar to wheat in that, it, it you know, obviously there's no spice uh, brought in with it. A um, little bit of honey. Um but overall, just really, um, everybody just really likes it um, that we've tasted on it so far. So it, it's uh, it's been really well received. You going to make some more of it? Well, you know, that's the challenge with whiskey, right? <laughs> Is you make a, one batch and everybody likes it, and they're like, when can we get more? And it's like, well, in a couple of years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm hoping to. I've uh, contacted the uh, the folks down at the farm and said, hey, you know, everybody seems to really like this stuff. Uh, let's get some more rice up here and make some more. So uh, um working on it, but it's probably going to be uh, a couple of years, right? <laughs> that means when it's gone, it's gone. And it's only available at the distillery in Little Rock. The price tag, $50 a bottle. By the way, Rocktown is also celebrating its 10th anniversary this year and its annual anniversary release is a blend of its five-year-old bourbon and five-year-old rye whiskeys distilled back in 2014, then re-barreled together for another six months. It's also available only at the distillery while supplies last. Elsewhere, Crown Royal has released the latest edition in its Noble Collection range, the Noble Collection Rye, aged 16 years, highlights the rye whiskey made at Crown Royal's Distillery in Gimli, Manitoba. It'll be available for around $70 a bottle. On the auction front, Bonhams held its latest whiskey auction this weekend in Hong Kong. The highlight was a complete 54-bottle set of Ichiro Akuto's Card Series whiskeys, from the old Hanyu distillery in Japan. The set had been on display at the Club King Whiskey Bar in Hong Kong for the last five years and sold for $1,520,000. Four Roses has announced plans to expand the Visitor's Center at its distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. 
It's being designed by the same Louisville-based architecture firm that was responsible for designing the original distillery back in 1910. The new visitor center will open by the end of next year, pandemic permitting. I wanted to update a story now that we reported on earlier this month on the bottle of Scotch whiskey that was given to British Prime Minister Boris Johnson by the Scotch Whiskey Association. It made the news because the value of that bottle exceeded the UK government's legal limit of 140 pounds. An SWA spokesman told us this week in an email that it's a common practice for the association to give a bottle of Scotch whiskey to senior politicians on special occasions. In this case, it was to celebrate the birth of Johnson's son. No word on what the bottle was. The common practice is also to rotate gift selections among the SWA membership. However, the Cabinet Office determined that it was above the legal limit for gifts. The policy does allow ministers to keep gifts that exceed the legal limit as long as the minister pays the retail price less than 140 pounds. The Cabinet Office would not tell us whether Prime Minister Johnson took that option. On that note, it is well known that former Prime Minister Winston Churchill was an avid painter. A Sotheby's auction this week in London featured one of his still lifes, Jugs and Bottles, depicts a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label, along with another bottle, glasses, and a water jug on a silver tray. The painting started a bidding war at Sotheby's, with a final hammer price of £983,000. That's about $1.3 million at current exchange rates. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Yes, it is a four-day Thanksgiving holiday weekend coming up in the U.S., but our Friday night happy hour webcast will be live on Black Friday. This week we'll have a media roundtable with whiskey writer Margaret Waterbury. Her new book, Scotch, A Complete Introduction of Scotland's Whiskies, is just being published in time for the holidays. Greg Swartz, the director of the new Scotch whiskey film, The Water of Life, will also join us, along with whiskey cast contributor Chris Ratcliffe. If you missed our webcast Friday night with Colin Scott of The Last Drop Distillers, or Saturday morning's show from Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore, you can always catch the on-demand replays at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events, brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. There's a free Glenfiddich Masterclass online with Mark Thompson this Thursday, presented by Waitrose & Partners, while Druitts will have a live online auction of rare whiskeys and wines that same day. The Spirit of Toronto Festival wraps up its series of virtual masterclasses this coming weekend with Ian McAllister of Glen Scotia on Saturday and Highland Park's Gordon Motion on Sunday. Buffalo Trace Distillery's annual Lighting of the Trace holiday celebration begins on December 3rd with lighting displays each night through New Year's Day. The Taipei Whiskey Club has a meet-up and tasting December 9th, and Bonhams has its final whiskey auction of the year on the 9th at its gallery in Edinburgh, Scotland, while McTeers wraps up the auction year on the 16th in Glasgow. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits, including a brand new rye whiskey, finished in Catoctin Creek's own Short Hill Mountain Peach Brandy Barrels. Peach Barrel Select Rye Whiskey is now on sale at the distillery in Purcellville, Virginia, and wherever you find Catoctin Creek whiskeys. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com for details, and please drink responsibly. And now, a Thanksgiving message from Robin Redbreast. 
what am I thankful for? Hmm. <laughs> Being on the smaller end of the bird scale. Happy Thanksgiving from Redbreast, proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by the 2020 Distillers Edition Collection. Swisher, Iowa has a lot in common with some of the towns we've talked about and visited frequently over the years here on Whiskey Cast. Places like Bardstown, Kentucky, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and Tullahoma, Tennessee. They're small towns with a tightly knit community surrounded by farms. And, of course, they all have whiskey distilleries. Okay, you're probably not as familiar with Swisher, Iowa. It's about halfway between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, due west of Chicago. Fifteen years ago, the Quint family opened Cedar Ridge Winery and Distillery in Swisher. Earlier this month, they accomplished a major feat for any small-scale distillery. The Iowa Alcoholic Beverages Division controls all liquor sales in the state, and each month the agency publishes its sales revenue by category for the previous 12 months. This month's report showed that over the last year, Cedar Ridge, Iowa Straight Bourbon was the state's top-selling bourbon. No qualifiers like best-selling Iowa-made bourbon. Top-selling bourbon, period. Murphy Quint was a teenager when his parents, Jeff and Lori Quint, opened Cedar Ridge. Now, he's the head distiller. How's it feel to have Iowa's best-selling bourbon made in Iowa? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, um, it feels amazing. I mean, you know, as a company, that's something that we've been working at for, I'd say, the last uh, three or four years. You know, we've been kind of tossing that idea around um, as, as at least making it a goal. And then over the last two years, it's become kind of something that we've we've been fairly obsessed with. I'm um, just trying to get to that number one spot. So um, it it feels amazing to get there. Um, you know, it's it's something that we're really proud of. We're proud that uh, an Iowan bourbon is uh, the number one seller in the state of Iowa. Um, we think that that's fitting and that's great. And um, yeah, it it was, it was a long time coming. That's for sure. I think you've accomplished the goal that every craft distiller dreams of, of having their whiskey selling on a par and actually beating the big guys in your home market. Um, yeah, absolutely. It almost seems like it's unrealistic when you're starting out. I mean, you know, I am fortunate to be able to say that I was with Cedar Ridge early on, and I'm, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work at a couple different craft distilleries at this point in my career. And, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, going from a, a distillery that started out really with, with no focus. I mean, we'll, we'll make a little vodka today, you know, a little rum tomorrow and maybe a little gin next week to, uh, to us really hammering bourbon. And, uh, you know, as, as we were putting more and more of it away and getting really good at that, um, we needed to get better at things like marketing and branding and, and building a, a distribution network and, and a stronger sales focus. So, I mean, there's so many different elements that came into play in order to uh, to get to this point. And, uh, I mean, it took us a very long time to get here, uh, but we, we finally made it and we're, we're really excited about it. What did you think when you got the word from the, uh, the state liquor control board, since Iowa is a control state, what did you think when you got the word from them that you had actually accomplished this? <laughs> um, just, you know, it was just hard to believe. Um, I mean, we knew that, you know, we knew going into that month that um, there was a, a really realistic chance that we were going to pull it off based on where we had been uh, the month prior. So we knew that it was within reach. Um, and then we put some effective uh, programming in place. We put some effective uh, advertisements and promotions in place that helped us kind of close the deal. But um, so, like I said, we, we knew that we stood a chance, but there was something about seeing the actual report that showed us that we did indeed get that number one spot. Uh, it, it was one of the best feelings that, uh, that certainly that I've felt in my career so far. And I know that I can speak for pretty much the entire team that, uh, you know, it was, it was a really unbelievable moment. And you did this without having to resort to uh, stunts like price cuts and things like that. You did it based on just pure, honest sales, full price sales and hard work, right? 
Um, yeah, for the most part. I mean, so th- we did do some, um, in, in the state of Iowa, it's different. Um, we can't just flash our, our pricing. What we can do is we can offer, um, what's called promos via the state where, um, for instance, if you buy 50 cases, you know, you can get an X dollar promo check that can go to wh- whatever the store wants it to go to. And sometimes it goes to lowering the price. So, um, in, in a way there was some of that in there, but, no, it's not like we just uniform drop the price from $35 down to 20 Um, It, it would have been done through more uh, marketing and promotional efforts. So, no, there was really no actual price cut, just, just some promotions that helped us get there. But that's something that you can't control how they spend that incentive <laughs> money. You, it's, uh, you can't uh, automatically say, well, we're going to go from 35 to $20 a bottle, and here's what we want you to do. It's... Uh, you can offer them the incentive, mm-hmm. but they can just pocket the money if they wanted to. Uh, um, yeah, that's exactly correct. I mean, uh, um, if we're offering them uh, that promo check, they can do whatever they decide to do with it. I mean, that, that can go either way. There's pros and cons from that. Um, you know, they, they might, you know, when you hope they flash the price, they might use that money to drop the price down a little bit. Uh, but there are times when you actually don't want them to do that. You want them to you know, maybe order 10 or 20 cases of your product. So you offer them a promo check, but you might want the price to stay at its normal shelf price because as we all know, moving the price around too much can have an impact on a brand, whether it's positive or negative. Um, if you've got a more premium offering, a lot of times you don't want to see that price get dropped too low um, because it can, you know, people can make assumptions on the brand based off that price. And people can get used to that new price and they're not going to want to pay the normal retail next time they're in the store. So it can go either way, that's for sure. Let's get into the history now of Cedar Ridge. Give me the origin story. How did you guys uh, get started out on the farm? Um, Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I I kind of have a weird perspective of it because I was 15, 16 years old when my parents started the company. And I remember early on, I mean, it was entirely about actually just having a vineyard. Um, Early on, we weren't even going to be a winery distillery. It was just a vineyard. My parents bought this property out in Swisher, Iowa, and they were going to plant vines on it and maintain the vines. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. And obviously, if you're going to have a vineyard, you might as well have a winery, right? You might as well do something with those grapes. And so I remember my parents were starting to build the business plan uh, for Cedar Ridge Winery. And well, um, once again, one thing kind of led to another, as it always does. And um, my parents decided that, hey, we'll be an Iowa winery, but there's already a lot of Iowa wineries, so we need to differentiate. And one way we can differentiate is we can also be a distillery. So people will come to Cedar Ridge Winery, they'll try the wines, but while they're there, maybe they'll try one of our brandies or our vodka or our rum. And it's just kind of a unique, appealing offering that might get more people to come out and see us. So that's really how it all started. We were very wine-focused early on. But then as people started coming through our doors and seeing what we had to offer, we slowly started to take more of a spirits focus. Um, We are the first licensed distillery in the state of Iowa since Prohibition. So the timing was definitely on our side there. And um, as people, you know, responded in in a positive manner to our spirits, we started to put more and more of them away. And over time, there was a light bulb moment somewhere. Um, This one came from Jeff, my dad, um, that, hey, you know, Iowa is the corn state. We produce more corn uh, than any state in the country. And I think there's only one country in the world that produces more corn than the state of Iowa. So, I mean, we produce just insane amounts of corn here. And bourbon is made from corn. So why isn't anyone making Iowa bourbon? So that, like I said, was a light bulb moment that really got us interested in that field. And we started putting a lot of that away. And obviously, Iowans responded very well to that. They came out and they supported the Iowa bourbon early on, and uh, it allowed us to keep putting more and more of it away. And, you know, you fast forward to now, and now today we're the number one selling bourbon in the state of Iowa. So long story short, I mean, we started out uh, as a a, a wine focus. We've kind of flip-flopped on that. Now we're very whiskey-focused, primarily in the category of bourbon. Uh, Still today, though, we we do make uh, 20,000 gallons of wine every single year. We're not necessarily looking to grow that number, but we're always looking to improve our quality. So, hey, we're going to make 20,000 gallons again this year, but it's going to be better than last year. And that's kind of our goal on the, the wine front. 
What did you think when you first tasted your bourbon? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, um, it, it's, it's weird because I'm going to have a different perspective on that because I was quite young. Um, you know, uh, um, we'll, we'll, we'll say in this scenario, I was 21 years old when I tried it. And I mean, I, I wasn't very experienced with it. So I, I didn't really know what to expect. So I probably won't have a great answer there. Um, but it was kind of uh, after college when I moved out to Colorado, I worked at Stranahan's Colorado Whiskey for a few years. Um, and when I was there, I really, really developed an appreciation uh, for just the category of whiskey in general. So that's really where I fell in love with this. And eventually, obviously, ended up back at Cedar Ridge. And I did go back and I did try um, all, all of our bourbons from earlier lots and kind of see, I saw how it progressed over time. And um, I still think that the, the early batches were great. Um, I think we've, we've improved a lot since then. Um, but I, I think that uh, the flavor profile of them was still pretty darn good, and I am um, pretty proud of those, those earlier batches. So I'm assuming if you were at Stranahan's, you worked with uh, Jess Graber and Rob Dietrich at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, absolutely. Um, Jess, Jess Graber, I, I didn't get to work with a ton because I was one of the first hires right after um, Proximo had purchased Stranahan's. So um, I did get to interact with Jess a few times, but he wasn't the owner um, when I started working there. So I, I got to know him, but not super well. Um, Rob, however, um, I, I would consider him my number one mentor in this industry. Um, and he's uh, one, one of my greatest friends on this planet and someone I really look up to. So yeah, I've, I've gotten to know Rob quite well over the years. What did he teach you about distilling? Um, you, you know, so it's funny. Um, the distilling I guess not a ton on distilling only because when I worked there, I was working on the brewing, the mashing side of things, and then eventually became packaging manager. Um, so he was, he was definitely my boss. I mean, he led the production team, but I, I didn't really get to specifically distill under him. Um, but I mean, he, he taught me a, a lot of things along the way, um, mainly by example. And a lot of those things were management related. I mean, he, he really knew how to uh, run a distillery, uh, make sure that it was efficient. But also, and maybe even most importantly, he was good at making sure that everyone was, was staying positive and still having fun with it. Um, in these distilling environments, especially places like Stranahan's as well as Cedar Ridge now, um, places who have become quite efficient and, and are cranking out a lot of whiskey, um, it, it's actually easy to forget that you have a really, really cool job because um, you get caught up in having to produce more and, and meeting your quotas. Um, and it can be kind of kind of stressful and like I said you can forget how amazing your situation is and he was always really good at kind of slowing people down uh reminding them how, how much fun this was and and he was just really good at creating um team chemistry in a positive work environment so um he definitely he definitely taught me other things along the way um he's a, a phenomenal whiskey blender um and I, I'd say I learned quite a bit from him on that side of things as well um, but yeah, I, I, I suppose I learned a little bit from Rob in, in every category. So what finally dragged you back to Iowa? <laughs> um, so uh, it was about 2014. Um, I had just gotten engaged to my wife now, and um, we were we were ready to start a family. So uh, we figured uh, we wanted to be closer to our families in order to do that. My family obviously lives in Iowa, and hers in Chicago. Um, so we just, we decided it was probably ready to head back home. And that's, uh, when I got reintroduced at Cedar Ridge, obviously, um, we still, we still miss Colorado every single day. It's one of the most beautiful states on the, uh, you know, in the country, but, uh, yep, it was time to come back to Iowa and start a family. So that's exactly what we did. Let's talk about the whiskey now. While you're the number one bourbon in Iowa, Cedar Ridge is available in other states. Where is it available? Um, so, it, you know, it depends on which product specifically. I mean, if you want to get into just the Cedar Ridge, Iowa bourbon, which is mainly what we've been talking about here, um, we have a, a mainly Midwestern focus. So at one point in time, like, like any other distillery, really, we had stretched ourselves too thin. We were trying to be available pretty much everywhere, and we realized that we couldn't keep up with that. We couldn't build brand, brand awareness and be active in all those states, so we kind of pulled back to the Midwest. And what I, what I mean by that is basically Iowa, 
and the surrounding states. So you've got, you know, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, for the most part, are where we're moving most of our Iowa bourbon. There are some, some outliers in there. Um, for instance, Texas, we are available in, and some in Colorado as well. So that, that's the majority of our fr- footprint on Iowa. We, or sorry, on the Iowa bourbon, um, is in that Midwestern area. And the reason is we want to expand from a centralized location. Obviously, uh, the center of that is the state of Iowa, and we want to expand outward where we've got enough resources. Um, our brand is relevant in the Midwest because we're Iowa and that's where Iowa is located. Um, and we can, we're about four hours away from most major markets in this area. You know, we're four hours drive time to Chicago, Kansas City, St. Louis, uh, Minneapolis. So it's just a lot more efficient for us to drive around and promote the brand uh, in those surrounding states. So that's that's where we're moving the Iowa bourbon. Um, if you want to get into some other products, though, like our, our Slipknot whiskeys or our quintessential American single malt, those are uh, being promoted and distributed in different markets from that. So let's talk about what else you are making. Let's go into those other whiskeys now, with starting with the single malt. All right. Yeah. So. Um, we recently came out with our quintessential American single malt whiskey, um, which is uh, uh, my personal passion and pride and joy. I, um, you know, we are, we're mainly a bourbon distillery, obviously. Um, we're in Iowa, we grow corn, <clears throat> and we've gotten that number one spot. So that's our focus. But I'd say that my personal passion is producing single malt. And that also ties in with one of uh, my dad's passions, which is his love for scotch. So the two of us have always been really into single malt. Um, my production background was mainly at Stranahan's mashing barley. And so it, it's just something that we were both very interested in. And we decided that um, we should compete a little bit on a little bit larger of a scale than we have been with single malt. So um, kind of going back a little bit, we've been producing and selling single malt for a number of years now. Um, I mean, gosh, it's got to be at least six or seven years we've been selling it and, and producing it longer than that. But just this year, we decided to give it a facelift, try to dress the bottle up a little bit better. We found that most American consumers are struggling to figure out what American single malt whiskey is. It's slightly different from scotch. It's different from bourbon. Most American whiskey consumers don't know the category of American single malt whiskey yet. So one strategy we decided to go with was to redesign our label so that it looks a little bit more like a scotch label. And that has helped us a lot. Uh, it's, it's getting retail managers to put it in the Scotch section more often. And that's helping people kind of figure out what's inside that bottle. And we also added a little bit more content to the label that'll help describe what's in there as well. You know, most traditional American whiskey labels, think like Maker's Mark, for instance, it's a very bold brand name. And then everything else is uh, in smaller fonts or, or non-existent. That brand name is the focal point so that you can read it from all the way from across a room. Well, in, in the world of scotches, it's almost the exact opposite. The labels, smaller type size, different fonts, very elegant looking, uh, very descriptive. And so we decided to make our single malt look a little bit more like a scotch. And anyway, that's helping people figure out what it is. So yeah, we, we've um, decided to compete on a little bit larger scale in this category of American single malt whiskey. Um, it's going really well for us so far. We've done our first three batches. Um, they're getting really good reviews. Um, Whiskey Advocate just gave it a 91-point rating, which has been awesome. And uh, we're looking to move forward and continue competing in that category. And the other one I think you said was a rye? Um, so the other whiskey that, that we're moving forward with at work, we kind of call it our three-headed monster. We've got our Iowa bourbon, our quintessential American single malt, and then we've got our Slipknot whiskeys. Uh, let's see, about a year and a half ago, uh, started a partnership with the band Slipknot. Um, so Slipknot is an Iowan band um, that has been around for a long time now, and they have a, a global following, a global brand presence. Um, and they reached out to us wanting to make a whiskey together. And that's obviously something that we were uh, really excited about and chose to pursue. So what we landed on with them is uh, what is commonly these days called a burr rye. It's a blend of bourbon and rye. Um, so the, the band actually came out. Um, we tried through a number of uh, different barrels and a number of different blends and a number of different fruits and eventually settled on 
a blend of 60% Cedar Ridge bourbon and 40% Cedar Ridge rye. And we have two offerings um, at 90 and 99 proof. So the brand name is called Slipknot Number no. 9 Iowa Whiskey. And it, it is available um, pretty much throughout the country, as well as exported to about four or five other countries. So this one we're distributing on a much larger scale. And that's because Slipknot's brand got a global following. So it can be available pretty much anywhere. And obviously, um, COVID, COVID kind of put the hurt on us this year um, because our business model had been basically to follow Slipknot around on tour and make sure that we're distributing to the states that they're touring in. We're organizing bottle signings um, in whatever state, whatever country they happen to be on tour in. Um, and obviously, COVID shut down the tour this year. So it's made us pivot in many different ways. Um, one of those ways being how we've had to kind of modify our Slipknot sales structure. So anyway, it, uh, it's been a, a really fun product, really, really challenging and, and exciting for us to make because the Cedar Ridge flavor profile is typically a little bit uh, softer, a little bit more approachable. We always shoot for a really easy sip and whiskey, whether it's bourbon or single malt. Well, Slipknot is a heavy metal band. <laughs> um, you know, if you're going to make a, a whiskey that represents uh, a really bold band like them, it can't be, uh, you know, a, a really approachable, inviting whiskey. It has to be a little bit bolder. So it, it, it was fun for us to kind of accept that challenge. And we, one way we accomplish that is by blending a little bit of that rye with our bourbon. That rye just adds some spice elements. It kind of wakes that bourbon up a little bit so that, um, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say it's an aggressive whiskey, but it's just much bolder than our, our typical offerings. So I'd say that the, the Slipknot brands, as far as like approachability um, or, or just easy sipping whiskey, they're almost polar opposites from the standard Cedar Ridge bourbon or quintessential American single malt. I think it's a little ironic that uh, both you and your mentor, Rob Dietrich, are working with bands now because he's working with Metallica on Blackened. You're working with Slipknot and your whiskeys are going up against each other just like the bands do. Um, yeah. And you know, that, that it's, I think about that all the time. It's absolutely wild um, that that happened. And, uh, um, it, it's also bizarre that both of those things, him, uh, leaving straight hands to go to work for Metallica and Cedar Ridge taking on Slipknot. I mean, those happened within like one or two months of each other. Um, and you know, I, 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 I haven't spoken with him, so I, I can't, you know, I don't want to start revealing stories or anything, but uh, it was just really, really funny how all that happened um, and, you know, how we kind of revealed to each other that we were taking on uh, those partnerships at about the exact same time. So there, there's some funny stories there, and maybe one day he and I will get together and, and release some of those stories. I want to tell those stories when you guys do it. I want you to share them with <laughs> us, okay? You got it. Maybe uh, maybe we should get some sort of a joint interview. That'd be That'd be a fun time. And a head-to-head -head tasting of the Battle of the Band whiskeys. <laughs> ah, absolutely. Why not? You'll find a link for the Cedar Ridge website in our show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by the 2020 Distillers Edition Collection lineup of single malts from Diageo's Classic Malts. Look for this year's editions of Oban, Talisker, Lagavulin, Craganmore, Dalwini, and Glen Kinchy at a whiskey shop near you. And get the details at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Yes, the holiday season is here, and that means it's time for the Whiskey Exchange's annual release of A Fine Christmas Dram. This year's release is a 19-year-old blended malt matured in ex-sherry casks and bottled at 44.5% ABV. The nose is complex and well-balanced with raisins, orange peel, soft spices, dried fruits, and a hint of cocoa powder. The taste is spicy and fruity with dates, figs, and raisins balanced out by clove and cinnamon, with touches of brown sugar and dark chocolate that come out as the spices fade. 
The long finish has gently fading spices with touches of dates, raisins, apple cobbler, and cocoa. It's a fine Christmas dram indeed, and I'm scoring it a 93. Now the term vatted malt is no longer used in Scotland, but then again there really hasn't been an example of an American vatted malt until now. Lost Lantern brought together distillers from six American single malt distilleries to create edition number one of its American vatted malt. The distilleries, Balconis, Copperworks, Santa Fe Spirits, Triple Eight, Westward, and Virginia Distillery Company. The end result, a two-year-old vatted malt bottled at 52.5% ABV. The nose has notes of chocolate-covered cherries, orange peel, barley sugar maltiness, and a touch of charred oak. The taste is dominated by great spices with barley sugar underneath and hints of chocolate, tree fruits, and oak. The finish is long and warm with lingering spices, salted caramel, and chocolate. I'm scoring the Lost Lantern American Vatted Malt, edition number one, a 92. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Friday the 13th may be thought of as unlucky, and that's why Sagamore Spirit celebrates Rye Day the 13th instead. Sagamore Spirit is offering you the chance to win your own barrel of whiskey. Sort of. You can get all the details at sagamorespirit.com slash day the 13th. The contest ends December 31st. And Sagamore Spirit reminds you to always drink responsibly. The Last Drop Distillers has released a 1980 bourbon distilled at Buffalo Trace, though it was known back then as the George T. Stagg Distillery. I received a sample the other day. It's bottled at 45% ABV. The nose, luscious and sweet, with touches of maple syrup, molasses, espresso, and a nice oakiness. The taste has notes of black cherries, dry spices, maple syrup, molasses, espresso, cocoa powder, and a touch of oak tannins. The finish is long and dry, with a touch of oak, along with black cherries and lingering spices. I'm scoring the last drop, 1980 Kentucky Straight Bourbon, a 94. Finally, Jim Rutledge lent his talents to the team behind Blue Run Spirits, and its debut release of Blue Run Bourbon. It's bottled at 56.5% ABV. The nose is oaky with notes of tobacco, leather, cocoa beans, dark chocolate, and black cherries. The taste starts off with a brown sugar sweetness. Then the baking spices explode on the tongue, along with oak tannins, toasted caramel, and frosted cinnamon rolls. Adding water opens up touches of tree fruits while sanding off some of the rougher edges of the spices, and the finish is long and dry with slowly fading spices and hints of baked apples and black cherries. Jim Rutledge has done it again. I'm scoring the fall 2020 release of Blue Run Bourbon a 95. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,000 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Gabriel Cartarella again, the doer's guy. I've seen a lot in my years as brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch, like the time I got a hold of an actual letter written by Andrew Carnegie, a letter from 1891. In it, asking doers to ship a keg of whiskey to President Benjamin Harrison at the White House. Spoiler alert, we did. And the bourbon folks were not too happy about it. Pretty cool, right? Well, here's another story for you. In 2019, our master blender, Stephanie McLeod, became the first woman to be awarded Master Blender of the Year by the International Whiskey Competition. And a year after that, she won it again. 
Stephanie's first creation for Dewar's, Dewar's 15 year, is another piece of history. Sweet, floral, with notes of honey and toffee, a perfectly balanced addition to the Dewar's lineup. It's a great introduction to scotch for beginners, and it's more than complex enough to satisfy whiskey aficionados. So grab some Dewar's 15, call some friends, and make a few stories of your own. That's what a good bottle of whiskey is all about. Time now to open up the inbox for your voice. I figured I might run into Tom at the Tracer Bullet at the Sagamore Spirit Penny's Proof launch during our webcast Saturday morning since he's a known Sagamore Spirit fan. Instead, I saw this tweet from him later in the day. So bummed I missed you. It seemed like the Sagamore Spirit crew needed us to move along, understand that, so we didn't think we could come over to say hello. We did see you, though. Well, they did have several hundred cars in line, so I understand. Another time, perhaps. Daniel Gigerich tweeted a photo of a Jack Daniels promo pack with a couple of Jack Daniels and Philadelphia Flyers glasses, along with this note. For some reason, this made me think of just one person. Mark. Hockey and whiskey, perfect together. I like the whiskey, but not that team. New York Rangers all day. As a hockey fan, I love to see the game promoted in any way, so all's good. Be well. Thank you, Daniel, and you be well also. I can't wait for the start of hockey season again. I got a couple of tweets this week along the lines of this one from Carl Schmidt of the Morgantown Whiskey Guild in West Virginia. So, Whistlepig Rye is bringing to market something from a, quote, lost distillery in Northern Ireland. Anyone in whiskey media know more details? I asked the folks at Whistlepig Rye for an explanation and got this email from CEO Jeff Kozak, and I'm quoting now. Mark, great to hear from you. Always especially fun to chat with our friends from across the pond in Ireland. There are a lot of exciting things happening in Irish whiskey these days. If there's ever anything concrete we can share about future collaborations, launches, we'll be sure to do so with you. Enjoy the upcoming holidays. In other words, a nice way of saying no comment. If you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's wrap up the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Last week's Happy Hour webcast featured Kevin O'Gorman, Catherine Condon, and Dave McCabe from Middleton Distillery in Ireland. During the webcast, Steve Bishore from George Washington's Distillery at Mount Vernon in Virginia posted this question in the comments. What is the earliest known date for cask aging in Ireland? Well, the panelists weren't quite sure about an answer, but Kevin O'Gorman went back and did some checking with Carol Quinn, who manages the Irish Whiskey Archive at Middleton. Kevin emailed me this week, and here's what he had to say. I checked out the maturation history question with Carol, and the use of casks seems to really kick off after 1825. In that year, you have legislation enacted that introduces the concept of duty-free warehousing. This seems to have been a game-changer for maturation, as the distillers were not under immediate pressure to pay the revenue, so could afford to experiment with longer maturation. That's not to say it didn't happen before 1825, but certainly there is a lot more of it once duty-free warehousing is introduced. Thanks for the question, Steve, and thanks for getting us the answer, Kevin, and of course, Carol Quinn, one of the unsung heroes of Irish whiskey. If there is something that you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. 
Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist. A unique, triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and of course a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever wondered where Redbreast got its name? Well, let's go back to 1912 and be glad our bird-watching founder didn't spot the bar-tailed godwit that day. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. At Doers, we love a good story. And that's why we're always writing new chapters. Like our Ely Gal Smooth finished in Mezcal casts. With notes of sliced green pepper and a wisp of smoke, a world's first, Ely Gal brings cultures together for something truly unique. As a 174-year-old brand, we could rest on our laurels. Instead, we'd much rather continue writing. Because when you keep telling the same old story, that's when people stop listening. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.